Let us now proceed to apply the principle of social heredity to the subject of business economy, and ascertain whether or not it can be made of practical benefit in the attainment of material wealth. If I were a banker, I would procure a list of all the births in the families within a given distance of my place of business, and every child would receive an appropriate letter, congratulating it on its arrival in the world at such an opportune time in such a favorable community and from that time on it would receive from my bank a birthday reminder of an appropriate nature. When it arrived at the storybook age, it would receive from my bank an interesting storybook in which the advantages of saving would be told in story form. If the child were a girl, it would receive doll cutout books, with the name of my bank on the back of each doll as a birthday gift. If it were a boy, it would receive baseball bats. One of the most important floors, or even a whole nearby building, of my banking house would be set aside as a children's playroom, and it would be equipped with merry-go-rounds, sliding boards, seesaws, scooters, games, and sand piles, with a competent supervisor in charge to give the kiddies a good time. I would let that playroom become a popular habitat of the children of the community, where mothers might leave their youngsters in safety while shopping or visiting. I would entertain those youngsters so royally that when they grew up and became bank depositors, whose accounts were worthwhile, they would be inseparably bound to my bank, and meanwhile I would in no way be lessening my chances of making depositors of the fathers and mothers of those children. If I were the owner of a business school, I would begin cultivating the boys and girls of my community from the time they reached the fifth grade on up through high school, so that by the time they were through high school and ready to choose a vocation, I would have the name of my business school well fixed in their minds. If I were a grocer or a department store owner or a druggist, I would cultivate the children, thereby attracting both them and their parents to my place of business. For it is a well-known fact that there is no shorter route to the heart of a parent than that which leads through interest manifested in the offspring. If I were a department store owner and used whole pages of newspaper space, as most of them do, I would run a comic strip at the bottom of each page, illustrating it with scenes in my playroom, and in this way induce the children to read my advertisements. If I were a preacher, I would equip the basement of my church with a children's playroom that would attract the children of the community every day in the week. And if my study were nearby, I would go into that playroom and enjoy the fun with the little fellows, thereby gaining the inspiration with which to preach better sermons, while at the same time raising parishioners for tomorrow. I can think of no more effective method than this of rendering a service that would be in harmony with Christianity, and which would at the same time make my church a popular place of abode for the young folks. If I were a national advertiser or the owner of a mail-order house, I would find appropriate ways and means of establishing a point of contact with the children of the community. For let me repeat, there is no better way of influencing the parent than that of capturing the child. If I were a barber, I would have a room equipped exclusively for children, for this would bring me the patronage of both the children and their parents. In the outskirts of every city, there is an opportunity for a flourishing business for someone who will operate a restaurant and serve meals of the better home-cooked quality and cater to families who wish to take the children and dine out occasionally. I would have the place equipped with well-stocked fishing ponds and ponies and all sorts of animals and birds in which children are interested, if I were operating it, and induce the children to come out regularly and spend the entire day. Why speak of gold mines when opportunities such as this are abundant? These are but a few of the ways in which the principle of social heredity might be used to advantage in business. Attract the children, and you attract the parents. If nations can build soldiers of war to order by bending the minds of their young in the direction of war, businessmen can build customers to order through the same principle. We come now to another important feature of this lesson through which we may see, from another angle, how power may be accumulated by cooperative, organized effort. In the plan for the abolition of war, you observed how coordination of effort between three of the great organized powers of the world, the schools, churches, and the public press, might serve to force universal peace. We learned many lessons of value from the World War, outrageous and destructive as it was, but none of greater importance than that of the effect of organized effort. You will recall that the tide of war began to break in favor of the Allied armies just after all armed forces were placed under the direction of Foch, which brought about complete coordination of effort in the Allied ranks. 
Never before in the history of the world had so much power been concentrated in one group of men as that which was created through the organized effort of the Allied armies. We come now to one of the most outstanding and significant facts to be found in the analysis of these Allied armies, namely, that they were made up of the most cosmopolitan group of soldiers ever assembled on this earth. Catholics and Protestants, Jews and Gentiles, blacks and whites, yellows and tans, and every race on earth were represented in those armies. If they had any differences on account of race or creed, they laid them aside and subordinated them to the cause for which they were fighting. Under the stress of war, that great mass of humanity was reduced to a common level where they fought shoulder to shoulder, side by side, without asking any questions as to each other's racial tendencies or religious beliefs. If they could lay aside intolerance long enough to fight for their lives over there, why can we not do the same while we fight for a higher standard of ethics in business and finance and industry over here? Is it only when civilized people are fighting for their lives that they have the foresight to lay aside intolerance and cooperate in the furtherance of a common end? If it were advantageous to the Allied armies to think and act as one thoroughly coordinated body, would it be less advantageous for the people of a city or a community or an industry to do so? If all the churches and schools and newspapers and clubs and civic organizations of your city allied themselves for the furtherance of a common cause, do you not see how such an alliance would create sufficient power to ensure the success of that cause? Bring the illustration still nearer your own individual interests by an imaginary alliance between all of the employers and all of the employees of your city for the purpose of reducing friction and misunderstandings, thereby enabling them to render better service at a lower cost to the public and greater profit to themselves. We learned from the World War that we cannot destroy a part without weakening the whole, that when one nation or group of people is reduced to poverty and want, the remainder of the world suffers also. Stated conversely, we learned from the World War that cooperation and tolerance are the very foundation of enduring success. Surely the more thoughtful and observant individuals will not fail to profit, as individuals, by these great lessons which we learned from the World War. I am not unmindful of the fact that you are probably studying this course for the purpose of profiting, in every way possible, from a purely personal viewpoint, by the principles upon which it is founded. For this very reason I have endeavored to outline the application of these principles to as wide a scope of subjects as possible. In this lesson, you have had the opportunity to observe the application of the principles underlying the subjects of organized effort, tolerance, and social heredity to an extent which must have given you much food for thought, and which must have given your imagination much room for profitable exercise. I have endeavored to show you how these principles may be employed both in the furtherance of your own individual interests, in whatever calling you may be engaged, and for the benefit of civilization as a whole. Whether your calling is that of preaching sermons, selling goods or personal services, practicing law, directing the efforts of others, or working as a day laborer, it seems not too much to hope that you will find in this lesson a stimulus to thought which may lead you to higher achievements. If perchance you are a writer of advertisements, you will surely find in this lesson sufficient food for thought to add more power to your pen. If you have personal services for sale, it is not unreasonable to expect that this lesson will suggest ways and means of marketing those services to greater advantage. In uncovering for you the source from which intolerance is usually developed, this lesson has led you also to the study of other thought-provoking subjects, which might easily mark the most profitable turning point of your life. Books and lessons in themselves are of but little value. Their real value, if any, lies not in their printed pages, but in the possible action which they may arouse in the reader. For example, when my proofreader had finished reading the manuscript of this lesson, she informed me that it had so impressed her and her husband that they intended to go into the advertising business and supply banks with an advertising service that would reach the parents through the children. She believes the plan is worth $10,000 a year to her. Frankly, her plan so appealed to me that I would estimate its value at a minimum of more than three times the amount she mentioned, and I doubt not that it could be made to yield five times that amount if it were properly organized and marketed by an able salesman. Nor is that all that this lesson has accomplished before passing from the manuscript stage. A prominent business college owner, to whom I showed the manuscript, has already begun to put into effect the suggestion which referred to the use of social heredity 
as a means of cultivating students, and he is sanguine enough to believe that a plan similar to the one he intends using could be sold to the majority of the 1,500 business colleges in the United States and Canada on a basis that would yield the promoter of the plan a yearly income greater than the salary received by the President of the United States. And as this letter is being completed, I am in receipt of a letter from Dr. Charles F. Crouch of Atlanta, Georgia, in which he informs me that a group of prominent businessmen in Atlanta have just organized the Golden Rule Club, the main object of which is to put into operation on a nationwide scale the plan for the abolition of war as outlined in this lesson. A copy of that portion of this lesson dealing with the subject of abolition of war was sent to Dr. Crouch several weeks before the completion of the lesson. These three events, happening one after the other within a period of a few weeks, have strengthened my belief that this is the most important lesson of the entire sixteen. But its value to you will depend entirely upon the extent to which it stimulates you to think and to act as you would not have done without its influence. The chief object of this course, and particularly of this lesson, is to educate more than it is to inform, meaning by the word educate, to adduce, to draw out, to develop from within, to cause you to use the power that lies sleeping within you, awaiting the awakening hand of some appropriate stimulus to arouse you to action. In conclusion, may I not leave with you my personal sentiments on tolerance in the following essay which I wrote, in the hour of my most trying experience, when an enemy was trying to ruin my reputation and destroy the results of a lifetime of honest effort to do some good in the world. Tolerance. When the dawn of intelligence shall have spread its wings over the eastern horizon of progress, and ignorance and superstition shall have left their last footprints on the sands of time, it will be recorded in the book of man's crimes and mistakes that his most grievous sin was that of intolerance. The bitterest intolerance grows out of racial and religious you will depend entirely upon the extent to which it stimulates you to think and to act as you would not have done without its influence. The chief object of this course, and particularly of this lesson, is to educate more than it is to inform, meaning by the word educate to adduce, to draw out, to develop from within, to cause you to use the power that lies sleeping within you awaiting the awakening hand of some appropriate stimulus to arouse you to action. In conclusion, may I not leave with you my personal sentiments on tolerance in the following essay which I wrote, in the hour of my most trying experience, when an enemy was trying to ruin my reputation and destroy the results of a lifetime of honest effort to do some good in the world. Tolerance. When the dawn of intelligence shall have spread its wings over the eastern horizon of progress, and ignorance and superstition shall have left their last footprints on the sands of time, it will be recorded in the book of man's crimes and mistakes that his most grievous sin was that of intolerance. The bitterest intolerance grows out of racial and religious differences of opinion, as the result of early childhood training. How long, O oh master of human destinies, until we poor mortals will understand the folly of trying to destroy one another, because of dogmas and creeds and other superficial matters over which we do not agree. Our allotted time on this earth is but a fleeting moment at most. Like a candle we are lighted, shine for a moment, and flicker out. Why can we not so live during this short earthly sojourn, that when the great caravan called Death draws up and announces this visit about finished, we will be ready to fold our tents, and, like the Arabs of the desert, silently follow the caravan out into the darkness of the unknown without fear and trembling. I am hoping that I will find no Jews or Gentiles, Catholics or Protestants, Germans or Englishmen, Frenchmen or Russians, blacks or whites, reds or yellows, when I shall have crossed the bar to the other side. I am hoping I will find there only human souls, brothers and sisters all, unmarked by race, creed, or color. For I shall want to be done with intolerance, so I may lay down and rest an eon or two, undisturbed by the strife, ignorance, superstition, and petty misunderstandings which mark with chaos and grief this earthly existence.